All right. You keep it up. So let's go on to the, uh, let's carry on a little bit. Huh? And uh, when the Bhasariputta says the following, that is the cause, that is the reason why some sentient beings are not fully extinguished uh, in the present life. So uh, there you are, it's all about perceptions, uh, knowing how to perceive appropriately. In other words, it's uh, very much to do with the idea of right view. Right view and perceptions are very closely related to each other. How we perceive the world, how we see the world uh, are very, very similar. Yeah. There, um, there's a nice sutta in the, which I haven't included here, which I, which I did include when I was doing the retreat in Sri Lanka. And it's a sutta on what is called vipalasas. Vipalasas means uh, distortions of the mind. And uh, it's only one sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya 4. Uh, but it talks about these distortions of the mind. Uh, and uh, the way it is explained in that sutta, it says that there's three kinds of distortions of the mind, three levels, if you like, of distortion. Uh, the level of views, uh, the level of perception, uh, and the level of thought. Uh, yeah, so three levels. And these three levels, they are very closely related to each other. Yeah, they're not kind of separate. Uh, the mind, when we deal with the mind, it feels almost like a unitary thing. Yeah? But you can uh, also divide it into different functions of the mind. Uh, yeah? So the idea of uh, perception is what is our immediate impression of the world. That's kind of perception. Uh, and then we think about that immediate perception of the world. That's kind of the the chitta vipalasa, the distortion of the mind or the distortion of thinking. Yeah? And through that perception and thinking, which is distorted, yeah, we then have distorted views about the world. Yeah? We view the world in a certain way. Yeah? And because we view the world in a certain way, that informs in turn our perceptions and then our thoughts, which then reinforce our views. So these are kind of all linked up together in a, in, a, in a way. And it's very hard to kind of break out of that uh, because our entire mental apparatus, in a sense, is uh, uh, thoroughly uh, saturated or thoroughly, yeah, maybe saturated is the right word, uh, uh, with uh, the distorted perception or distorted uh, distortion of reality. Yeah? So everything we do, our entire mental uh, uh, construct uh, is, in a sense, uh, distorted in this particular way uh, so hard to get out, yeah, because of that. Uh, so this is the idea of vipalasas. Uh, and so because we come into this world, we come in with all of distorted perceptions and views and, uh, and thinking, uh, yeah, this is why we have a problem. And this is why we kind of, we tend to carry on in this way. We don't understand that these things are problematic. Uh, and according to the commentary, then these, these kind of form a kind of cycle, the views are leading to to perceptions leading to thoughts going around and around and around. Uh, and it's very hard to break out. And the, one of the ways of breaking out is to develop perceptions uh, to the contrary, which lead us in a different direction. Uh, this is what this is uh, really about in this particular sutta. So the Vipalasa Sutta is kind of interesting. It throws a bit of light on the idea of why the mind is so distorted and how it tends to be a self-reinforcing, a self-perpetuating process uh, that is difficult to come out of. Uh, so uh, let us look at the other side of the coin now. What is the cause, Reverend Sariputta? What is the reason why some sentient beings are fully extinguished in the present life? Yeah, so this is how you become fully extinguished. Huh? Do you want to become fully extinguished? Huh? Yes, yeah, okay, good. You're very brave. Okay, good. <laughs> I know sometimes when people say extinguish, I think, wait a minute, extinguish? What does that mean exactly? <laughs> we can come to that later on, yeah? But uh, the idea here is basically the idea of awakening. Think of it in that way. That makes, kind of makes it easy. Yeah? So what is the reason and what is the cause? Reverend Ananda is because some sentient beings truly understand which perceptions make things worse which keeps things steady, which lead to distinction, and which lead to penetration. Yeah, so if you want to become enlightened, this is all you have to do. You have to understand these perceptions, and then you have to practice accordingly. This is really all that is required. So uh, again, you know, it's very, um, the path is often very simple. 
and often we make the path very complicated by the way we, uh, by maybe, you know, by thinking too much about the wrong kind of things or intellectualizing too much or by trying to figure everything out beforehand. Uh, but actually the practice of the path is very, very simple. Uh, uh, the hardest part of the path uh, is to really understand what we should be doing, to understand the idea of right view. And that, that is very hard because our perception of the mind is distorted from the beginning. Uh, it's actually very hard to get our mind kind of straightened out and see things in the right way. That is the hardest part of the path. Uh, and that is not difficult as such. It just takes perseverance, it takes time. But it's not a difficult thing to do. Yeah, you just have to remind yourself, you have to kind of keep looking in the right way, and then things kind of gradually come out of that. Uh, and so you have to understand what things make, uh, what perceptions make things worse. Uh, you have to understand that when you look at people in a certain way, uh, you become angry. Uh, yeah? Okay, wow, okay, that's a good point. When I look at the person in this way, I become angry. Patiga Sanya, it's called in the suttas, uh, or Patiga Nusaya, the underlying tendency to... Uh, Patiga is like resistance. Yeah? You resist something in a, different per in a certain person. Uh, and so when you see that resistance coming up in yourself, uh, then often uh, irritation or ill will or negativity is not very far behind. Yeah? It comes up very, very soon behind it. Uh, and so you can see the connection between your perception of that person uh, and then the arising of bad qualities as a consequence. Uh, and so you ask yourself, you know, you see the danger, you know, okay, so what can I do about this? Uh, and then gradually you change your perceptions. Uh, you look at people in a new way. You make things better as a consequence. Uh, you, um, we're going to talk more about the idea of impermanence later on, but I think impermanence is a very, very powerful perception. And it is very powerful just in how we think about our ordinary life. Yeah, very usually when we think about our ordinary life, we tend to think of things as far more permanent than they actually are. This is a big, big problem. Uh, and when we understand that the things in our ordinary life are problematic, they are unreliable, they are impermanent, uh, that is when we turn in a different direction. Uh, because we start to understand if you want a refuge, uh, you've got to have that refuge somewhere else. Uh, yeah. So, you, you know, uh, I will talk about this a lot later on because it is very important. But uh, just to uh, very briefly give an idea of what I mean is like when you turn on the news on TV and you see something bad happening in the world, what do you think? Do you think, oh no, another war? Is that what you think? Yeah. Or do you think, oh, yeah, yeah, I expected that? Uh, it's, it sounds a bit cold, cold hearted when you say, when I put it that way, but I do that on purpose, right? Uh, what is, what, is your, what is your expression? And, and if you say, oh, no, there's another war, that means you haven't really taken on board the idea of impermanence. Yeah? You are expecting things to be permanent in the world. You're expecting the world to carry on as it already is. Mm -hmm. That is what I mean by the perception of permanence. It's very simple, right? Or you hear about someone being killed. I heard you had some shops being bombed here recently. In the, they say, yeah, did you expect that or not expect that? <laughs> Most people don't expect it, right? They're shocked when the kind of the unpredictable things happen. Uh, but the idea of Buddhism is to, uh, is to um, uh, uh, predict or to assume the things are, the unpredictable things are going to happen. Uh, yeah? Expect the unexpected. Uh, that is what we should be doing. Uh. And you may think, how can you expect the unexpected? Well, that's the whole point. Yeah? We expect random stuff to happen in a sense. Uh, that's how you know that you're holding on to things uh, because you say, oh no. You want things to be one way when things actually are another way. You are actually assuming a kind of permanence in the world around you. The same thing when things closer to you happen. Yeah, when the Buddhist fellowship, Buddhist M fellowship, when you have someone die here. I don't know if someone has, has any one of your members died recently? Huh? You think, oh no, they're dying. What's gonna, what are we going to do now? Yeah. Do you think that or do you think, oh yeah, they died. They have been a good person anyway. They're probably going to be happy. Afterwards, no problem. Let, let them go. Uh, yeah. What, what, how, how do we how do we relate to these things? Uh, especially if someone is very old and the body is getting very bad. Well, actually, it's quite nice to get rid of the body. Yeah. So we should be happy on their behalf. Uh, so it's not so bad. Uh, so uh, and so it, it's just this is what I mean by understanding impermanence. Uh, yeah. We kind of start to review, think about the world in a different way. Uh, everything changes meaning. Uh, we look at things in a new way. Uh, and so uh, this is how, what I mean by 
perceptions that make things worse uh, and perceptions that don't make things worse. This is exactly what this is about. Uh, and it's kind of fascinating because some of these perceptions, like the perception of impermanence, is so profound. It helps you with the ordinary perceptions in ordinary life. Uh, then it also brings it into your meditation practice. It is also very powerful there. And also, at the end of the day, it goes all the way to the very end of the path. You become an arahant because of the perception of impermanence, yeah? dealing with it properly. So this perception goes through all of these four things we see here. That is how, how powerful it actually is. So you understand what works, yeah? what, what makes things worse. Then you understand what th keeps things steady. So you keep on contemplating a certain thing to kind of steady it out. What leads to distinction? Again, more of the perception of impermanence, perhaps. Uh, yeah, uh, in particular, when you come to uh, samadhi, for example, uh, yeah, you give things up, uh, and the perception of giving things up, well, that leads eventually to the distinction of samadhi. Samadhi is sometimes called distinction. It's called the Anlang Arya Nanadasana Visesa in the Sutta, the distinction of knowledge and vision of the noble ones. Uh, yeah, and so this is... Um, that uh, perception that leads to distinction is a perception of giving up, uh, giving up things in the world, abandoning dukkha, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and finally leading to uh, that profound insight when you penetrate things uh, fully into the nature of reality. Very often, the same kind of perception going through and through to deeper and deeper levels. Uh. So that is the path for you. Uh. So it's very simple. Yeah, very straightforward. Uh. Yeah, is that right? Uh, maybe. <laughs> I've just been to Sri Lanka, so in Sri Lanka everyone goes like this, so I kind of take it off. <laughs> it's kind of cute, isn't it? I find it kind of cute when you go like that. It's kind of, uh, so I, I, I collect cute things in the world. Uh, so in Sri Lanka, I collect this one. Uh, in, in Malaysia, I collect the la ending, no la. That's also, also kind of cute, right? No la, no la, no la, yes la. <laughs> so you add up. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Thai or from Thailand? Okay, good question. So, what, what do you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> so, Thai uh, Chai, okay, yeah, yeah. Singapore is, is la, yes, yeah, so, yeah. Same, same as Malaysia, la, la. <laughs> May, is it? Okay, all right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I think maybe maybe Thailand, I just follow Ashangana. Okay, 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 okay. That's kind of my, my favorite saying from Thailand. Yeah. So, anyway, so this is the uh, the various perceptions, and then he says that's the cause, that's the reason why some sentient beings are fully extinguished in the present life. So uh, that is assuming you want to be extinguished. If you want, don't want to be extinguished, then don't practice these perceptions. The uh, Pali word for extinguished here is uh, parinibhayati, and it is the, the verbal form of nibbana, or parinibbana. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the present life, actually, I don't have the Pali with me. That's, that's terrible. Uh, wait, why don't I have that? Uh, so, <laughs> um, so, let me see if I can find the Pali here. Which, which suit was it again? Four hundred and, what was it, 476? 179. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah. Uh, now, should we use Sudha Central? Okay, use Sudha Central. This is Sudha Central, by the way, if you haven't seen this before. This is where we find all the discourses in various kinds. Uh, numbered discourses, uh, numerical discourses, uh, fours, uh, 179 is down here, 179 here, chapter on invitations. There you are, extinguishment, yeah, Nibbana. This is the parliament. Let's go English and partly side by side. It's kind of nice. And... Uh, so side by side, ding. Take away the uh, all those stupid little references, ding. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Can you see? It's very small, isn't it? Uh, yeah. How's that? 
But uh, ah, now it comes one after the other, that's even better as well. Now we're really talking here. Yeah? Okay. So this is the last part. We talk about the uh, uh, extinguishment. You can see the Pali word down here, parinibayati, yeah? Parinibayanti. Yeah? It means to become fully extinguished. And we have the phrase over here, ditteva dhamma. This means in this very life. Yeah, ditteva dhamma over here. Yeah? So you become fully extinguished in this very life. Yeah? So uh, that is the idea. So... Um, Now, the, the idea here with using a word like extinguished uh, is that this is literally what the Pali actually means. Uh, yeah, when you something becomes nibuto or nibbana, it means like a flame going out. Uh, and so the idea of extinguishment is actually a very good way of rendering nibbana or paru nibbana. And so I, I, this was actually a word that was originally suggested to me by Venerable Bhikkhubodhi because he wanted to use that. Uh, and I, I think I originally said extinction, but extinction sounds even more negative, right? So he said, no, no, extinction, too negative. He said, okay, extinguishment is better. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> do you want to become extinct? So that was what <laughs> and so uh, this is what it is. It's going out of a flame. Yeah? And uh, of course, once you think about it like that, uh, you know that the flame is very hot. Uh, flame burns you. Uh, if you get anger, anger is like a heat in the mind. Uh, strong desire is also like a heat. Strong desire makes you restless and uh, all of these kind of things, restless and agitated. Uh, this is also like a heat in the mind. Uh, and so the extinguishment is like a cooling down. Uh, yeah, It's like becoming cool in a sense. Uh, and uh, if you look at your meditation practice uh, and when a meditation starts to work, uh, yeah, you start to become more peaceful, the thinking mind is less uh, active than it usually is, uh, it normally feels nice, uh, right? Uh, that's how you know that extinguishment is nice. You think, yay, wow, extinguishment, cool stuff, uh, yeah, and then you kind of carry on with more and more extinguishment. And for every level of extinguishment that you reach, uh, the more beautiful the experience is. Uh, yeah, it's actually very, it's a very, very pleasant experience. Uh, and this is how you get a positive perception of the idea of extinguishment. Uh, otherwise, it can maybe sound a bit, uh, a bit negative. Uh. So we have to be careful with this, uh, this terminology. Yeah. So uh, this is why some beings become extinguished in the present life. Uh. So uh, this is the nice thing about Buddhism. Everything happens in the present life. You don't have to wait after you're dead. Yeah. Isn't that kind of nice? Uh, so, and I think this is one of the great things about uh, Buddhism is that uh, you don't have to wait till after you pass away to find out what is true. Uh, because it is, in, in a sense, it is unsatisfactory that you have to wait afterwards, yeah? Because you don't actually know. Uh, and there's something kind of a uh, little bit scary about that. Whereas in Buddhism, at least theoretically, everything is in principle available in this life. And I think that is a much more satisfactory way of uh, dealing with a spiritual life. Mm. We had sold this already. Okay. So there you are. That is the, uh, the first sutta of this retreat. Uh, so, um, yeah. This is about, again, the idea of uh, perception, how to perceive the world, uh, and very closely related to the idea of views. Uh, as we develop our perception, the views also kind of line up in a similar kind of way. So these things are very closely related to each other. Uh, so now I'm going to look at uh, a sutta, which uh, is uh, sometimes talked about quite a bit in Buddhism, uh, known as the Madhupindaka Sutta, uh, sometimes called the... Uh, lump of honey, the honey lump sutta or the honey ball sutta or something like that. Uh, it's called by Ajahn Sujato has translated as the honey cake sutta. So uh, coming up here. And uh, this is uh, uh, from the Majjhimanika, the middle length sayings of the Buddha number 18, uh, Madhu Pindika sutta. And uh, this sutta is... Um, 
often discussed, and it's often discussed because it's considered by some people to be part of the idea of dependent arising or dependent origination. Uh, that is why it is discussed. Uh, and uh, I would say it is not really about dependent origination. Uh, it is about a small part of dependent origination, just like rebirth is part of dependent origination or feeling is part of dependent origination. But just because feeling is part of dependent origination, it is obviously not enough yeah, to make it. And the same thing with the content of the Madhupindika Sutta, although it is part of, if you like, the engine of dependent origination, which makes the whole process work, although it is, part of, it is not in itself dependent origination. It is just a sub-aspect, just like any individual factor. And this is actually very important to understand because uh, uh, if we misunderstand uh, what dependent origination is about, uh, then also there's a very big chance of misconstruing the whole idea of the Dhamma. And uh, I probably have talked about this here before. I cannot remember, of course, everything I've said uh, at this, in this particular seat. I've been sitting in this seat a number of times now. But uh, how do we know whether a particular teaching is dependent origination? Uh? It is not always labeled, right? The Buddha doesn't always say this is dependent origination. How can we know? How can we know what is not dependent origination? And the answer is actually surprisingly simple. And the way you know is that we have to go back to the second noble truth. And the second noble truth is uh, the dependent origination is an expansion of the second noble truth. They are basically showing the same thing. And the second noble truth, what does that show? Well, it shows that craving is the source of suffering. But it is the source of suffering in a particular way. It is a source of suffering via rebirth, the porno bhavika tanha. Yeah? So there's three factors that make up the second, second noble truth. First of all, the tanha, which is like the defilement, yeah? which is the cause of the problem. Then you have the result of the problem, which here is dukkha. And that dukkha happens via rebirth. Yeah? So if you have those three aspects somehow mentioned, uh, the cause, which is the defilement, uh, the result, which is the dukkha, and then the rebirth in there, which kind of is part of the dukkha thing, if you like, those three aspects together, then you have dependent origination. Uh, these are the three elements that you need. Uh, so if you don't have rebirth in a particular sequence, it doesn't really talk about uh, dependent origination. It just talks about a sub-aspect uh, of that teaching. Uh. And uh, so this is actually a very important point for this particular sutta because uh, it is sometimes understood to be dependent origination, but actually it is not really quite the case. Uh, it is more just part of the engine under the hood, if you like, uh, that drives the process. Um, so... Uh, we're going to look at this now, and the idea behind this particular sutta, the reason why I want to look at it, uh, is because it concerns how perceptions arise. What are the driving force behind perceptions? How do they come about? And if we understand the engine that underlies perceptions, then we can also understand the mechanism that will change those perceptions, right? How we actually can do something about it. And so this is what this is about. It's like a preliminary, a little bit theoretical sutta, perhaps, but which gives us uh, access to understanding what we then need to do. And then we come to the more practical suttas uh, very soon. Uh, all right, so let's just uh, dive into this sutta. It, it is a little bit uh, profound, uh, a little bit deep. And so you have to just uh, bear with me, but please don't be afraid. It, will be, uh, it should be okay. Is anyone here afraid of the suttas? No? <laughs> you never know. Sometimes people are a little bit afraid, but I'm... Okay, good. <laughs> okay. So I have heard at one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the Sakyans, near Kapilavatu, in the Banyan tree monastery. And in Nigroda Rama. Nigroda is a Banyan tree. And staying in Kapilavastu, which is the, uh, was at that time the capital town of the Sakyan Republic, uh, the Sakyan Republic being the uh, home republic of the Buddha himself. Uh, and he came from the Sakyan clan, yeah, which were, were his, uh, his clans, his family members, essentially. So now he's basically visiting his family. That's what he's doing, going back to the Sakyans. Uh, and... Uh, 
What is kind of interesting is that if you travel to India today, you can actually go to places like Kapilavatu. Yeah, it's kind of really fascinating. Have many, many of you been to India? Yeah, you have a few of you been to India? Okay, good. Yeah, excellent. Was it, did you enjoy it? Yeah, yes, okay. You don't have to say yes, you know, you'll have to say no, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Little, maybe. <laughs> Enjoyed, enjoyed part of it and did not enjoy other parts of it, maybe. India is kind of a complicated place. Uh, <laughs> good and bad mixed together. Chaotic place, that's right. Uh, yeah. And uh, But anyway, you can go to India and there are two places that are competing uh, about being Kapilavatu. Yeah, one is in Nepal, one is in India. And uh, they both claim, equally claim it equally forcefully. No, this is, we have the real couple of it. What you have is fake news. Yeah, we are, that is, don't trust, don't trust those people across the border. Yeah. And uh, this is often the way it is. And unfortunately, often it is politically motivated because you want to have more, uh, you want to have more tourists and these kind of things. Uh, so it is often not motivated by real historical research, but more by political concerns, which is, a bit sad, right? Uh, you hope that people were motivated by a real search for the authentic place. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the place that is in India, uh, this there was uncovered the archaeological excavations done there. They uncovered little kind of uh, um, like coins or medallions or whatever you call them uh, with the inscription Kapilavastu. Yeah, so if we find that kind of thing, it gives a very powerful claim to being the right place. Uh, so if you go to India, then look for the one, uh, not, don't go to Nepal and look for Kaplavatu in Nepal, look for Kaplavatu in India. That is much more likely to be the real one. Uh, yeah? So uh, just that's my kind of hot tips on India travels. Uh. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone, I'm actually going to India in December, actually. I don't know if anyone here is coming along, uh, but uh, that's going to be a very interesting uh, little trip. Uh, and uh, are we going to Kaplavatu? It's a good question. I'm not sure now. I haven't really looked that closely at the itinerary. I can't remember how. Anyway, it is there. So this is uh, Kapilavastu and the Banyan Tree Monastery, the Nigroda Rama. That is where the Buddha goes, uh, and he's going to uh, talk to his uh, clansmen, his family. Um, yeah. Let's stop there, because... Uh, uh, Time is again going faster. So I think that's a nice place to stop. So I think we have just started the new sutta and we can carry on next one uh, very soon. So uh, let's do a little bit more meditation together uh, and then we will have a Q&A in a second. Uh, okay. So let's... Carry on. So, uh, any questions or comments, please? Yeah. Yeah. But the uh, lady at the back there, do you still want to ask us a few questions, questions uh, coming? But before that, uh, Ajahn, maybe uh, I'll hand the mic to, to, uh, to the questioners. Uh, one question from me. For you? Yes, okay. Uh, All right. Sure. Um, when you say develop perceptions, uh, many a time we we also understand perceptions are conditioned. Mm. That means uh, we, in a sense, can't help but perceive it that way. Uh, we are not in control of what we perceive mm. in that sense. So when you say develop that perception, then how do we develop something that we already have a certain perception that is already there in the first place? Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't seem like it's, yeah. it's, it's just, you can just switch it, right? Yeah, no, exactly. So the, the, this is the thing, the, the perception is conditioned. Uh, and uh, what that means, it means two things. It means that the perceptions that you have now, they come from the past and they are there because of the past, uh, whatever happened to you in the past. Uh, but uh, by that very same, for the same, very same reason, uh, it also means they can be changed yeah? be precisely because they are conditioned, because they have become what they are because of cause and reasons. Uh, it means that you can do something with it and you can add new calls and new reasons and then the perception would change accordingly. Uh, so the, the fact that they are stuck from the past or the fact that they are conditioned from the past doesn't mean that there is no way out. It just means that uh, it, it's a given now, but the future is still open. The future can still be changed. Uh, so, the, you know, and this is what uh, 
this is what brainwashing is all about. Yeah, this is kind of <laughs> you come here to be brainwashed. The problem is with most brainwashing uh, in the world, it doesn't make your brain any cleaner. Uh, but the Buddhist brainwashing actually makes you cleaner as well. So this is kind of the, it's a double brainwashing, double the double meaning kind of the brainwashing. Uh, so that's kind of the nice thing about the Buddhist brainwashing. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, any questions? Uh, I think, thanks. Good <laughs> morning, Ajahn. Um, I wish to ask a follow-up questions, right, from that earlier Sutta mm. perception. And uh, subsequently, you explain about from perceptions, it, it produces views or something like that. Mm. So, but wouldn't it like chicken, egg, egg, chicken kind of thing? Because perceptions also somehow to a certain extent is also how it relates to that person or that events, right? It also conditioned by the views. So that's actually, when you look at things, right? If you were to um, see things as new as every moment as impermanence. Mm. So you really cannot tell which condition which. As in whether perceptions is because of the views, the past views, or views is because of what we perceive. Yeah. Yeah, it goes it goes together. Yeah, and this this is kind of the problem. They they, they condition each other. Yeah. So what we have to do is we have to uh, because they condition each other. We that's why we have to kind of um, uh, start start somewhere. And the places we can start is by starting to look at things in a new way. Yeah. Yeah, and this is a little bit of views, a little bit of perception. So we are, in a sense, we're dealing with the mind as a whole, in a sense. Uh, Jung is called the development of perception because that's kind of how the Buddha phrases these things. Uh, we're just developing how we look at things, uh, but it has an effect on the view. Sometimes you may just be given a view, like the Buddha says, the river, I think, okay, I accept that. Okay, that's kind of your view is then changed, but then that also affects your perception, as you say. So they are completely interlinked with each other. That's exactly right. Uh, so you just start where you can, and where you can start is, okay, let me try to look at this. Yeah. Thank you, Arjun. My second question um, is relates to the, uh, the presence uh, sutta. Uh, Arjun, in the opening, you mentioned about dependent origi originations is not there. It requires the, the three of the four noble truths. Yeah. Can Arjun clarify that better? Uh, uh, yeah, no, it doesn't require three of the four. It requires, uh, I'm just talking about the second noble truth. Huh? Yeah, only the second oh, noble truth. Yeah, and the second noble truth is about the origin, the origin of dukkha. Yeah, it's about this. It's called the uh, it's called the samudaya satcha, the, uh, the truth about the origination. Uh, that's kind of the name of the second noble truth, uh, and it's about how suffering comes about, how it starts. Uh, yeah, that's the origin of dukkha, and the and dependent origination is o dependent origination is also about the or origin of dukkha, because dependent or origination tells you that from avidya, from ignorance from delusion uh, arises ultimately dukkha, except it goes through 12 steps. And so those 12 steps of dependent origination are an expansion of what you see in the second noble truth. Uh, in the second noble truth, you see craving leading to dukkha via rebirth. Uh, in the dependent origination, you see ignorance leading to craving, leading to rebirth, leading to dukkha. It's the same, the same basic principle there. And any sequence of cause and conditions that has those three factors in them will be a kind of dependent origination. The problem with dependent origination is that it is often it is um, expressed in a large number of different ways in the suttas. And so you have a 12-link sequence, and you have an 11-link sequence, the 10-link sequence, the 9-link sequence, the 8-link sequence, the 7-link sequence, the 6-link sequence, the 5-link sequence, right? Uh, so after a while, you wonder, well, are they all dependent origination? Only some of them? Okay, this is how you know. They have those kind of things in common. Uh, that's how we can figure it out. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, good morning, Ajahn. Mm. Uh, my question is uh, perhaps related to the previous questions. Mm. Um, I'd like to understand or better understand, how do I know if I'm holding on to the right perceptions, to the right view? Because um, personally, I always have, I, I, I've been feeling this conflict. I always question myself, is this the right perception or am I um, delusioned by my ignorance? And because I'm always questioning myself, I um, and even when I meditate, I cannot find that peace. I cannot find that calmness because I'm always yeah. questioning myself. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Excellent. Good, good question. <laughs> 
So uh, what, what you have to do, first of all, is you have to realize that there are certain perceptions that are worthy of questioning and some perceptions not really worthy of questioning. And it's also about time and place. And so when it comes to meditation, leave it aside. It's usually the, the wrong time to kind of question your perceptions too much. Uh, so when you meditate, just kind of go with the flow, become peaceful, let things be, and don't kind of try too hard to look at things in any particular way. Uh, um, so you, first of all, it's about knowing when. And the, the, the time when uh, your perceptions really matter is when you feel that your mind is heading in the wrong direction. Yeah? You're getting upset with somebody. Uh, you feel maybe excessively greedy about something or whatever it might be. Uh, when those unwholesome mental states arrive, that is when perception becomes important. Uh, and uh, there are many things in the world like, you know, judging somebody or, or whatever, where actually perception is kind of irrelevant. You don't know what's happening. Okay, that's okay. That's not, these are not important things. Should I vote for this part or that party? Okay, that's got nothing to do with the Buddhist teachings. Yeah, so it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, so uh, a lot of perceptions are not important. So focus on those where it has to do with morality. It has to do with, uh, with kind of how you can change your outlook about things. Uh, uh, for example, you may, you know, you feel, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, when you feel that things in the world are difficult or sad or whatever, actually, okay, the Buddha said this is the issue, so I need to shift my perception and find refuge not in the world, but find refuge in the Dhamma instead. Yeah, by finding refuge in the world, what I mean is that you are relying on things to always be there for you. You're relying on things to be in a certain way. You're relying on things not to be impermanent. Yeah? This is what we very often do in practice. We are relying on our friends not dying. But we can't rely on that because our friends are subject to death. So we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah? So we've got to try to look at that in a slightly different way than being able to deal with it in a better way. Yeah? And so, you, uh, and so you, you, you ask yourself, you know, there are specific cases, uh, instances where that uh, perception needs to be changed and where it matters. Uh, and in many cases, kind of irrelevant, doesn't really matter so much uh, because it's kind of neutral from a Dhamma point of view, whether you perceive it as A or B. Uh, so, um, yeah, something like that. Does that, is that helpful? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, excellent. Uh, yeah. Hi, right. Ajahn. Um, about this discernment, can, I, uh, can it be said that the vipassana, watching the moment to moment, that is already the discernment? That means you're watching the process. Um, it depends, yeah, because you can watch things but not necessarily get wiser. It depends on how you watch them. Yeah, you yeah. watch them, and yeah. then you you you, you yeah. have a certain wisdom. Oh, this this is how it comes to be. This this yeah. is what. So that is this discernment, right? Yeah, I I would say that I would say it depends on which stage of the path you are and, and what you're trying to do. And if you are early stages on the path, for example, yeah, one of the ma most important things that we're trying to do is to have an even mind. A mind which doesn't kind of get upset about things and these kind of things. That's the one of the most important things. Uh, and so our when we watch the mind and we see things arising, we see passa, we see contact, and all these kind of things, uh, then we should actually be aware, okay, now, now I'm getting upset about something. Uh, and the moment you are aware of that, then you can take use the strategies of the Buddha to go in a different direction. Uh, yeah. And sometimes I think that um, this, uh, sometimes we can just focus too much on mindfulness in its own right. Just be mindful, and that kind of is that is good enough. But the whole point of mindfulness, it has a purpose. Yeah, and we need to we need to investigate. Well, what is the purpose of mindfulness? And the purpose of mindfulness on the early stages of the path is to help you to um, achieve a certain purity of mind, to let go of bad bad uh, habits and move on to good habits. Later on, the purpose of mindfulness is to help you in meditation practice, to become peaceful. Later on again, the purpose of mindfulness is to see impermanence in things so you can become, uh, you can let go of um, you know, all the things that we hold on to. So with this idea of just being mindful and then you know, don't, without context, to me, is not really how the Buddha taught in the suttas. It is always a certain purpose and we need to remember the purpose. Then it becomes really powerful. The same thing with watching pasta arising, yeah, is a kind of mindfulness. So what is the purpose behind that? Yeah.
if you are a very wise person, and this is actually one of those interesting things, how do you know that you're wise? Uh, yeah? And I, <laughs> because I, you know, you hear people, they do meditation and they do all kinds of things. Uh, and, uh, you know, they uh, see arising and passing away. And sometimes people think that they have some wisdom, some, some insight. Uh, but how do you really know that? Uh, how can you actually be sure? Uh, there's a very simple test. Uh, and the test is how peaceful do you become? Uh, yeah? If you get deep stillness in a meditation, you have quite a bit of wisdom. Because deep stillness requires letting go. It requires giving up. And that letting go and giving up comes from wisdom. Uh, so you know your wisdom by seeing how peaceful you are. But sometimes people, I think, are deluded about their wisdom. They think they have achieved some insight, but actually they haven't. Yeah? They have, oh, I've been watching all of these things. Well, okay, test it out now. See how peaceful you become. Yeah? Then you will know. Her. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, if we can take more questions, maybe a little bit at the next session, uh, because uh, we need to carry on with the suttas as well. Huh?